Welcome to Inside Startup Investing, the only podcast where you can invest in every guest. On this episode, I will be speaking with Dutch Mendenhall, founder and CEO of RAD. If you're looking to diversify into the real estate asset class and want access to best-in-class operators who know how to build large, diversified holding portfolios, this is the episode for you. Some of the highlights from my conversation with Dutch include, one, the fact that RAD has built one of the first real estate investment firms that allows everyday individuals like you and me to invest in professionally managed real estate portfolios. Incredibly, they have already grown assets under management into the hundreds of millions of dollars from thousands of everyday individuals. What I also loved about my discussion with Dutch is learning about how RAD is expanding into new asset classes like farmland and golf courses to find new alpha opportunities for investors. And lastly, I think it's always valuable to hear from experienced operators about the benefits of getting into the real estate game alongside experts who do this day in and day out to get you, the investor, optimized potential returns. So with that, let's get on to the show and welcome Dutch. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you here today, Dutch, because what you guys have built in the real estate investing space uh, is incredible. And I, I've, I've been a, a major, major fan of what you've built, and I'm excited for kind of our audience to get to know more about you all. So with that, I would love for those who don't know you, give us a little bit of background on yourself and what RAD is all about. Well, you know, I grew up and as I played Little League and, no, I, I'm one of those guys who, you know, really had to build a real estate, you know, portfolio real estate from scratch. You know, I lived on my own at 16 as a baseball coach, college baseball player, and, you know, I wanted to find out how not to have the world control my finances, the world control my life in a lot of ways. And it, real estate was the path. You know, I remember a late night Robert Kiyosaki commercial, you know, at, you know, 2 a.m. and, and watching that thing and buying his products, you know, back in 2007, you know, 2006. And, and, you know, I began my journey with just, you know, flipping that first house, buying that first in investment property. And, you know, you know, you fast forward today and, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of investors. And, you know, we have golf courses and we have um, a cattle auction business with our income producing farmland that we have. Um, we're very diversified, right, as, as an organization. And, and for us, you know, it's like, what is the next adventure? You know, that's all how I look at real estate. You know, I buy off-market, non-market real estate. I buy, you know, stuff that, that, that people can't see, you know, where it's headed or where it's going. We're reading the data. We're reading the trends. Um, and, and we're an operator, what I call a true operator. Like, I, my, myself, um, my team of acquisitions that are out there, like, they, they live, breathe, and die this stuff. And so, you know, it's like I get on you know, a phone call with one of them, you know, my acquisition guys, who's I also call a friend, right? Um, 10 o'clock last night when we were talking about um, a specific neighborhood where we think the property values are going to jump to three to 500,000 um, from 300,000 to 500,000 over the next two years, just because of the neighborhood, because of the surrounding neighborhoods, because of the data, but also just because of the art form. And like, so, you know, it's like how many, you know, good properties can we buy in, in that neighborhood to, to to win, right? And so it's always, for us, it's what's the win for the investor. So there's so much to dig in on there. Um, you're talking about all the different types of properties that you guys are investing in. But what makes it so cool, right, is that you're providing exposure to this diversified set of real estate to everyday investors like myself. So let's talk about kind of the platform that you've built and how you're connecting investors to a diversified portfolio of investments. Yeah, and we won't, like, this, you know, we're not making an offer, right, while we're doing this. And, like, if you end up on one of our websites or something, read the circulars, read all the different things, do all that stuff. Like, for us, it's just to give people paths to invest, right? And, and it's whether it's on a singular investment deal and they just want to do one deal um, or they want to invest into a whole portfolio of deals. I mean, the reggae industry is mind-blowing, you know, to um, be a part of that industry, you know, the last, you know, five years has been, you know, incredible. And, and it's something that passed in 2012 with the Jobs Act that, that the average American didn't know anything about. It's where crowdfunding came from. Um, it kind of, in my personal opinion, equaled the playing field between the rich and, rich and the, the working class in America, right? And, and there's been a lot of investments non-available to the working class in America for a great many times. I personally think it's unconstitutional. Um, I'm a very big pro-American, you know, pro-veteran um, a lot too myself. So, but yeah. So you are providing exposure for everyday investors to be able to put small amounts into either a diversified portfolio of real estate investments or, in fact, individual investments as well. 
So one of the things that I, I personally have found really interesting about the real estate space over the past decade since kind of the Jobs Act really came about is that, you know, there's been a lot of players who came into the space that led with technology that have since gone under. So you mentioned something when we first got going here, which was that you guys are operators first. Tell me about how important it is. Yes, there's a technology layer in connecting people to these investments, but how important the operating function, the acquisition function, the being a real estate company, how much that matters. What does your team like look like? How are you doing that? There's a deck we have that shows the difference between a retail investor and, and a true operator, right? And, and, and a true operator you know, buys 10, 15% below market. A true operator you know, is gonna get a little more appreciation, right, than, than what I call a babysitter. A true operator isn't just gonna buy because you know, Zillow says good information about a property or some other you know, data site does. And so you know, a true operator understands this market inside and out. It makes, it makes a huge difference. You know? um, if you have a property management company that just you know, buys a new washing machine, they're gonna charge you an extra 25%. If they're gonna you know, replace a roof, they're gonna charge you an extra 25%. So for us as a true operator, right, we're, we're getting discounts. You know, like when I go to you know, Lowe's or Home Depot to buy materials, and we buy them from wholesalers and other places as well, but I still save 25%, right, as, as a true operator. And so when you start compounding all those numbers, it's how we become you know, really profitable. And in, in, in what we do is just, you know, you're in this every day, there's just a scale to it and a way to do it. And you know, I was doing education for years and years and years, and I still do a lot of real estate education. And, and our book, Money Shackles, you know, breaks down more between a true operator and what a babysitter is. And you get a you know, multi-billion dollar hedge fund who's never really invested in real estate suddenly goes and buys $300 million worth of real estate, do they really know what they're doing or are they just reading some data and making some decisions? You know? and, and for me, it comes back to the individual person, right? I remember taking people to these real estate auctions and I would, they would bring cash, cashier's checks, right? Because a, a lot of auctions you have to pay right then and there. They would have plenty of money to buy. We would find them properties, I mean, insanely, like 30, 50 cents on the dollar. I mean, mind blowing, right? And we'd have a lot of them come skeptical. They'd be like, no possible way they're buying properties 30. I'm just coming here to prove Dutch wrong, right? And, and they would come and they'd be mind blown that they'd be there. But then a lot of them still wouldn't pull the trigger. And, and it's just the, the fear of the operations. It's the fear of, of, you know, being in the trenches. You know, a lot of an individual doesn't know what to do if somebody, you know, forges a deed and, and steals a property. You know, um, they don't know where the right lawyers to go to. They don't know the right process. They don't know how to actually, you know, get money from a title company if they make a mistake, right? All of these different things they're not sure of and they might not have the same insurances, right? And so, you know, for them, they came to me and they just said, Dutch, put your money where your mouth is and invest with us. And that's when I made the shift and change and just went from my own investments or my own deals to, you know, investing, you know, in partnership with others. People will say, and again, this is more kind of the technology companies that ironically have gone out of business. Um, but people will say that, well, just being a real estate operator, that's not scalable. So yeah. tell me how you guys are making it scalable or, or maybe more importantly, how are you making this profitable? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's not scalable. I mean, I think BlackRock's a pretty good sized company. Um, you know, one of the largest REITs in the world. I mean, real estate is real estate, right? I mean, I, I don't know uh, a billionaire in the world. I don't know anybody that's a multimillionaire that doesn't invest in own real estate. It, it is part of the world. I mean, what's scalable to us, right? Um, buying good assets, buying good property, right? It, can, we, can we pay less for insurance for our properties because of our scale? Yes, right? Can we um, negotiate with banks differently because of our scale? Yes, right? It's that age old thing like, if, if a bank doesn't, you know, if we have $60 million in loans with, with a bank, then, then and we decide, you know, we're going to not do something, then that's our, our choice. An individual does that, then, then they're in big trouble. You know, a recent bank, I was reading their loan documents, and as I'm going through their loan documents, I'm like, this is abusive, this is usury, this is, like, I'm reading, looking through these, and, and, and I mean, and I'm surprised I'm catching it versus, versus, even versus our lawyers, and I take it back to our lawyers, Right, and we went and negotiated, renegotiated the loan docs, right, for the investment properties we were doing because I'm like, I'm not going to do loans with them, right, if this were to put, but an average investor doesn't know what, what usury is. An average investor doesn't know, right, what some of the abusive terms they were asking, taking a power of attorney over your, your, your property. Like, there's a whole lot of different things that they were doing, and like, 
I'm like, an investor shouldn't, shouldn't do that. And, and if you're an investor, you're not protected the way a residential, right, just a homeowner is, right? And, and there's, there's more, you know, mortgage protections in place for them. And so, you know, for me, I think that the scalability is, is what we are able to do um, from a scale standpoint. Like, if I was doing 10 properties or having my own property management, it doesn't make any sense. But at 500 properties, it, it makes sense. It's kind of like when I look at apartments. You go buy a 10-unit apartment complex, it's really hard to make the math work to, to run it unless you're running it yourself as a human being, right? But you go buy a 50-unit apartment building, now you can have a property manager in there, you can have a maintenance come, come and go, you can have landscaping come and go, and those things can be paid for in the scale of, of the business and the operation. And a mistake a lot of people make is they don't know how to calculate those things in. And, and so they think that something's, you know, X amount of rental income, but they're not calculating all the expenses that come with that rental income, and so only by scale, right? Does it make sense to to you know have others operate real estate for you? Now, I would love to understand kind of the scale and scope of your business. So when we talk about you know, I, I know you have multiple different kind of real estate asset classes you're investing in, yeah. um, but you know, how many homes do you you have? How much assets under management do you have? What does that look like? Through all of our different entities and different things, right? We're 500 plus homes, right? Um, we have. Um, about seventy million dollars worth of farmland, about little, you know, seven thousand acres. Um, we have cattle auctions, we have golf courses. Um, we're about two hundred and fifty million if you look at our businesses and our, because a golf course is a business and real estate at the mm -hmm. same time. The cattle auction is a business that's partnered with our farms, right? And so, like, we have the exclusive right to sell feed, right? Um, at the cattle auction, which then allows our farms to have, you know, a profitable model, right? But they all run in run in silos, right? So we have a head of farms and, and, and farm operations. We have a head of golf courses and golf course operations, right? And golf courses are fascinating. I, I, I think I'm going to have a lot of fun with them in the next, you know, four to five years because it's interesting. Nobody's going to build more golf courses. Land is too valuable to build a golf course at this point mm -hmm. to put in a brand new golf course. And you have a lot of golf courses and even ones that we own that may be developed right over time. And you get, you know, farmers will get really mad if you think they think you're going to develop their farmland. And I don't, I agree with that, right? But nobody cares if a golf course turns into houses except for right. the people golfing at the golf course, right? And so, you know, it, it's an interesting, you know, gambit. You know, if you look at, we bought a, you know, 122 acre course here in Florida for $1.8 million. And you do that price per acre and you're like, that's nothing right as a price per acre but it you know acres in that area an acre of land is easily worth two to four hundred thousand dollars depending on the neighborhood neighborhood it's in and now you look at you know a property that's a hundred acres and you do two to hundred four hundred thousand an acre you know a property about for 1.8 million could be worth 20 million could be worth 40 million right in the in the years to come granted you can't build on all that and there's some wetland protections sure. and conservatory, but let's say you can build on 50 of those acres at 400,000 a pop, you're at 20 million, you know? And so, you know, there's some cool stuff. You know, we bought a piece of land in Rancho Cucamonga, 265 acres um, for 1.4 million. Um, I don't think the owners knew they owned the land until we contacted them. And, you know, they just did the $3 billion bullet train, you know, from, from Rancho Cucamonga to Las Vegas, um, literally right after, you know, we put the property, you know, under our belt. You know, it's just this stuff that's going on in the world. Like if you know the trends and you're an operator, you can see things. Absolutely. 250 million in assets under management is certainly nothing to sneeze at. That's pretty incredible. Um, so when we, we, you know, it's great to have the assets under management, but end of the day, it all comes back to how are you returning dollars to investors? Yeah. Um, so for those who have never real estate invested or just getting into the game, help us understand how the actual mechanism works. You put in money under you know, management with RAD, now how do I get my return? There's distribution, so 20, 20, 20, 21, 20, 22, we had, we had distributions, right, for, for our investors. Um, so there's distributions is the one way. That, that money can come to you. And for us, so we're a weird reggae. And I say in the sense that we're a weird reggae, we're a reggae that actually allows investors to withdraw or to redeem um, their investment with us, that they're allowed to sell their stock, right? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, reggae's, right? And, and we'll go through, like we're going through a qualification process with Rad America right now. Um, we'll re-begin a new qualification with Rad Diversified, I believe this, this early this summer, you know? Um, and as you go through those, the, once you become SEC qualified, you can accept non-accredited 
um, and accredited investors. And so, you know, you have to file all your documents with the SEC. And so, you know, even if you're within our, what we call our regulation Ds, which is mainly for accredited only investors, you know, we still have a six month redemption process. So we allow people to, to do redemptions twice a year. Um, I think it's a pretty, pretty cool thing. Um, what we've realized over the years is, you know, for us, we've had very minimal redemptions, which has allowed us to focus on investing and allow us to focus on growth. And a lot of people are like, Dutch, you're crazy. Like tie up their money for five years. If they invest in your re, you know, tie them, tie it, tie it, tie it. It's what everybody kept telling me. And I'm like, I mean, I like investors to have access to their capital, right? Um, you know, I found during the pandemic, there was a lot more emergencies that people had. I found right now with super high interest rates, I feel like there's a lot more people um, with emergencies. You know, I feel like there's certain medical emergencies, people, different things. And so for me, we always want to, you know, support our investors and different things. But reality is, is like real estate isn't investing, isn't to make sure that you're able to live today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a real estate investment is to make sure that you're able to live free tomorrow, right? And, and, and every time you, you take your money and you take your capital and you use that for a lifestyle, you're stealing away from yourself later in life. And, and the great part about real estate is there's this compounding effect to the investment, right? Over time, this compounding effect is what makes great wealth. The ability to have a half million dollars, right? And be able to buy a, let's say an $800,000 property. And instead of having $500,000 working for you, you have $800,000 appreciating over the years and over time, right? And over the years, your mortgage remains the same, but your rents and your money coming in on it climb and they climb. And so you get more and more cash flow and you get more and more right freedom. I mean, the power of real estate is so amazing. I mean, you get depreciation, um, which is a tax write off, right? There isn't a lot of investments like in the markets with Wall Street that you invest into and then you get a write off, right, for it. You don't get to depreciate with those investments. So you know, there's a lot of cool things with real estate that make it um, so advantageous. And I think now if you're looking at it and you're sitting on the fence because you're like, well, interest rates are high and those kind of things. Well, you're never going to find properties at these prices. Um, the last time we saw properties at great prices, like great buys, was after the 2008 crash. Well, we're 2024, so we're 16 years later. And so, you know, we got a window right now that I think will close um, after this election. And it doesn't matter which side is elected, they're both going to invest heavy, heavy into the housing industry. And so, you know, your ability to buy now, you know, is, is, is unique. And so for us, it's how liquid can we get? How much capital can we get? How many more assets can we buy? Um, you know, that's our goal. And, and how much cash flow can we produce? Well, and I would imagine at your scale, okay, you know, even if you're investing right now and buying into kind of the higher interest loans, one, you could refinance all of that. And I imagine you'd be in a fairly decent leverage position to get optimal rates when the time comes. Is that right? Yeah. And I mean, you look at Red REIT, Red REIT went from $10 a share um, to twenty five oh four a share from 2019 to 2024, right? Wow. Rad America opened, um, which is mostly our farmland and our golf courses and our income producing land, opened uh, late last year and we've gone from $10 a share uh, to $12.97 a share, right? Hmm. And so for us, if we're paying, you know, 8%, we're paying 9%, we're paying 7%, you know, on a loan, but we're making the returns that we've made, we've grown our equity the way we're growing, the math makes sense. You mentioned Florida, California, where some of your properties are. Are there other regions you're investing in? And what type of behavior do you look in for the markets that you're investing in? Yeah, I mean, we're in Texas. We are in, um, huh. we're in Texas, Florida, California, and Pennsylvania. So we're pretty, pretty diverse with, you know, left and blue states. We're pretty diverse with east and west, right? Because for me, not all markets move the same. A lot of people think the whole nation moves exactly the same all the time. It doesn't. You know, um, if Trump's elected this coming election, the left um, is going to be moving into left states, right? What happened after Biden was elected? The right moved into right states. We're going to see more of a political divide. And so we're preparing for that migration with our buying and, and the types of assets we're investing into, um, into different markets because I think it's a part of the trend, you know, for what's coming. Our farms are in Idaho, um, Arkansas, and Tennessee um, ac across the country. The reason I choose the residential markets I choose is because... AI is the future. Um, the AI is now. I we should be careful saying AI is the future because two years ago AI was the future, but right now AI is everything in this country. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have cities. So Houston's a great example. You have Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, right? And they're all you know anywhere from 2x 
to 1.5x the value of Houston properties, Houston assets, right? And I, like right now, I have a I have a 5,000 square foot home in this beautiful neighborhood, right? Beautiful yards. It's actually just one street, gated community, right? One entrance, in and out. Beautiful home, right? Less than a million dollars. You know, it's a, it's a $900,000 home. I mean, it would blow your mind how beautiful this house is, the pool, the yard, the neighborhood, you know, the community that it's in, um, $900,000. That same house in Austin, that same house in Dallas, is, could be a three, four, five million dollar home, right? And, and, and for me, AI is gonna take these cities and start to create balances because it's gonna cause value balance and value, values to start to come together. They'll never be equal. Right, but, the, but 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 it closes the gap. Same same reason we've invested in Philadelphia over the years. You know, years and years ago there was properties you can buy in Philly for five, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Right, and I bought <laughs> a lot of them. And but I knew that everything that was less than a hundred thousand dollars in value, um, in 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 twenty you know nineteen was quickly going to be worth a hundred thousand dollars in value. Those same houses then just a year and a half later I was like, man, those houses are going to go right to one fifty. You know, and and when you're buying something for sixty thousand dollars that goes to one fifty, it blows your minds, right? And those are where the rents are climbing um, and, and and growing. When you look at as a percent change, right? It's getting more and more expensive for 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 the working class in America to live. Now you mentioned REIT before, and you know there's traditional REITs that are listed on Nasdaq and New York Stock Exchange that people might be used to investing in. What are some of the key differences between you and kind of these traditional publicly listed REITs? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people call the the industry I'm in, you know, with raising capital, investing into real estate, they call it pre-IPO. Industry is a very common term that people people say to it. And companies like mine are often, you know, growing and building a business, you know, to sell someday. That may be That may be the case. I don't typically myself personally worry about that. Like, I'm just wanting to get the next amount of capital so I can buy the next piece of real estate, right? Um, every day. We're, we're a non-traded, right? Public REIT. Um, and, and, you know, we have to do financial reporting. We have to do third-party auditing. We have to do third-party evaluations of assets. At this point, we're, we're talking about the REITs a lot. So, yeah, read, read our offering circulars, right? Currently, we have an open Regulation D um, to accredited investors. We have uh, pr- previously had Regulation A's. Um, as which could bring in you know uh, non accredited investors, we filed new regulation A with the with the SEC so that we can allow non accredited to come in with us right um, but at the end of the day, like my goal is you know to ser- serve investors, read the offering circulars if you have a link to our stuff. Um, all investments have risks. If I say stock prices, past performance is not indicative of, of future performance. And right now, this isn't me pitching. This is me just saying, here's all the disclosures I have to do because of, because of, because of who, who, who we are. So, so I don't know if I answered your question or, or if I had to do those things just to, to, to make sure we dot our I's and cross our T's. You know, I, I just like to help people understand kind of the unique difference between these traditionally listed public REITs versus yeah. what you've built. Yeah, and they, I... I Go they trade on the stock exchange, right? They trade on Wall Street. Financial advisors do them. And like, granted, we've been on the Schwab platform. We've been on different platforms, right? And, and, and that's great, but we're not traded. Um, and what I, I like about that is there's nothing, you know, Bezos or Musk or Gates are going to say in the next week that's going to adjust our stock prices, right? Our stock prices are done by a third-party evaluation company um, that looks at our assets, looks at our operations, looks at us as a business and say, you know, here's you know, what, what the stock price can be for you as an organization um, based on a big portion of that is net asset value when they do their evaluation. They have other factors as well that, that they put into there. But at the end of the day, they do the evaluation and, and that determines our stock price. We only change it quarterly, right? We don't do daily um, minute by minute fluctuations. Um, real estate is not a daily minute, minute by minute fluctuation. I always laugh when REITs are on, you know, the stock market because their assets didn't change from one day to the next, right? It takes, assets take time, right? To, to invest, to, to uh, build, to repair, to fix, to sell, um, all the things that, that, that comes, with, comes with real estate. So, um, so non-traded, but have all the public, you know, we have to do all the public reporting requirements. I love that. And just to reiterate, because I think it's so important, what I think is really cool and excites me about RAD versus traditional REIT is the fact that a traditional REIT that's publicly listed, right? If they come out today and say, you know, interest rates are going higher or whatever, then the whole stock market's going to drop, including that REIT, regardless of whether the value of that REIT has changed in any way, shape, or form on that given day. 
And what's really cool about kind of these non-traded, you know, more private-like REITs is that it's truly based on the underlying value of the asset portfolio yeah. rather than the whims of the stock market, which for me as an investor, it, it puts more, uh, there's more control around the process and more assurance that like, if this thing appreciates, I'm going to benefit from the appreciation rather than just what's going on in the market. And I do think as an investor, that's really important to understand um, and help you know like, oh, this is, this is what makes this investment unique and valuable to me. So I just really wanted to highlight that point. I mean, and there's, you know, there's a lot of, I think, good when it comes to the ability to protect investors, right? Um, if we went through an 08 crash tomorrow, right, um, and investors freak out, everybody gets nervous, everybody goes bananas, and everybody wants to withdraw money, everybody's losing their minds, right? Well, what do we know happened in the 08 crash? Well, from 2008 to 2012, values came back. And not only did they come back, they came back and blew through the roof from what the values were prior to 2008, 2007, right? Now, as, as, as a REIT, if I don't have the ability to control, right, that with my investors, then, then everybody could, you know, be hurt in that situation. If you had to do a fire sale of properties to be liquid, all those things could, could be hurt. And so one of the great parts is we have the ability, right, um, BlackRock has done this, you know, for the last two years um, to freeze redemptions. If, if it puts the liquidity or it puts the assets of the total REIT, right, at risk and, and so for us after 2008 mm -hmm. there's a lot of safety mechanisms right that were put into place in order to protect the average investor because the reality is at, at the end of the day real estate always grows in values it has for a hundred years and there are there are windows right there is a one-year two-year three-year window where market shift markets change so for me that was always the best time to buy properties and best time to, to buy assets it's the best time to Get in deep. So there's about $250 million in assets under management, hundreds of properties. Um, would love to hear how many investors total have partaken and invested in RAD over the years. And as you think, you know, three to five years down the road, what does success look like for RAD? Yeah, I mean, we're over 5,000 plus investors. We're less than 10,000 yeah. investors, right? And I know what our, like our current count is, but I've actually never done a count to say since, you know, 2015 when we opened our first Reg D you know, how many, how many, you know, investors since 2015, because people, people come and go. Um, but, you know, we're currently 5,000 plus investors uh, with, within, our, within our organization. That's amazing. And when you think a few years out, you know, what would kind of be your, your optimistic AUM you'd like to grow to number of properties? Do you have that in mind? I do, I do. I mean, what's kind of exciting is so my, my long-term plan, right, would, for the business, and, and I think this is coming, it comes more and more into picture, right, over the years is, you know, we have our RAD REIT, you know, it's 100 million plus in assets, you know, and that grows and that gets, continues to grow, right? And it gets to, let's say, a quarter billion in assets. And then we have RAD America and that gets to a quarter billion assets. And coming down the pi pipeline will be RAD Golf, right? Um, and that gets to a quarter billion as in assets, right? And we take these portfolios and we take these individual REITs that we have, right? We have our RAD Opportunity Zone Fund as well, which is a whole taxing we can always dive into someday um, for I mean for the audience we dive into it and and so we take those right and we merge them into one IPO and that IPO gives all of our investors a huge return at that point in time and so you know for me you know that's kind of the five year, five year window right um, we'll hit a billion in assets you know my belief is in, in, in five years um, at that point in time you know we IPO um, and, and that IPO is obviously the big a uh, big win for everybody so Love that. For those who want to get involved, learn more about Rad, where can they go? What should they do? Yeah, they can go to DutchmanInHall.com, right? Now, I know they'll see a book on there. Um, they'll see free trainings. They'll see different things, right? We're educators first, you know. Um, but you can get to, you know, there's RadAmerica.com. There's RadReet.com. But they can get all to all of that through DutchmanInHall.com. And we have our exclusive buyers groups, right, um, where people can do just one-on-one -on -one individual real estate deals with us. So... Awesome. Awesome. Well, Dutch, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. And for those who are interested in getting into the real estate game, uh, definitely check out Rad. Thanks and have a wonderful day. If you liked what you heard on the show today, you can check out Rad's various investment opportunities by heading on over to Dutch's website. And please like, subscribe, and share our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so more listeners like you can find us. Thanks for listening.